Shabbat Shalom, friends. What's been on my heart is Jesus wants us to remember th the significance of his washing of the disciples' feet. I think he really wants us to really go into a very humble place. And so often we humble ourselves before the Lord, which is good. But he wants us to humble ourselves before people, remembering that he didn't come to be served, though he deserved it, and he was the only one worthy, but to serve. So we're looking at John chapter 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. For all the work that Jesus had done by this point, all the miracles and multiplying and healing and preaching and teaching and prophesying. This is where he really, so to speak, rolls his sleeves up. He knows what's in the hearts of all men. So he knows that quite literally Satan has put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot. And you might ask, well, how does he have that power? Because we see in earlier scriptures that Judas was already a thief. He was already greedy and a liar. So because he was these things, he completely opened his heart to the enemy. And you know what I really perceive here when it says that the, uh, he knew that the father had given all things into his hands. This is so important right now because what I really perceive as something that the body needs to continue to address to really come into is bringing God's will to pass here on earth. We are more than we've all asked for God's will. Lord, do your will, have your will. We pray and we wait, but it is the works that accompany a living faith that it's time for this illustration of do you really believe? And too often I see, it's very easy to say I have faith, but there is very much a time for the doing now. There's a very vain and idle waiting over too much of the body. And what we see here is that Jesus knows the work set before him. The Father had given all things into his hands. And now remember, in other parts of scripture, he reminds others that if he wanted to, he could have called legions of angels down. The Father put all things into his hands. And nevertheless, he stuck to the plan, the mission, the purpose without straying. He brought it to pass actively and intentionally. It's almost like, you know, when your boss at work gives you a to-do list. You don't sit there and wait or wonder. You get that to-do list done. That is your work. And I believe there is so much work already drawn out for us in the scriptures that your next for many, perhaps for most, the next step that so many are waiting on, God, I'm just not going to move until you tell me what to do next. That is predicated on whether or not you do what you've already been told to do in the word. So continuing on. Verse four. Rose from supper. He rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. So 
you know, he's just, he's, if you would go clean the house, you know, you'd go and get in comfy clothes, clothes that you don't mind um, getting dirty or soiled or wet. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Can you just visualize that for a minute? They're all at the table and he gets up and probably whenever he got up, you can imagine that all eyes were on him. What's he going to do next? And he gets undressed and he puts his towel about himself and starts to fill a basin. I can imagine that no one said anything. And then he starts to wash their feet. Can you just imagine their eyes on him? Like, what, what is he doing? Verse 6, then he came to Simon Peter. And Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing you do not understand now but you will know after this. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. So this is really reminiscent of when Peter would say to him, uh, Lord, you'll never die. You know, I wouldn't, I won't let you die. And the Lord rebukes him. There's a lot of foreshadowing at the last supper. A lot of you know, he's really illustrating what he's about to do for them. But of course, they don't understand it yet. I mean, he's at the lowest of low, you know, especially, you know, he Peter is saying that to him because it seems like a menial task. Like, you're washing my feet? You know, like, you shouldn't be washing my feet. Like, you're too good for that. But Jesus is, he's teaching them something. Not to look at things that way. You know, so often we, we, we do that in our human wisdom, we're, our concern for worldly things. We think, even if we don't say it, that we're too good for that or we're better than that, you know? And maybe you can do that in a lot of places in your life, but the one place you can't do that is on this walk, specifically as it pertains to others. Walking in you know, a lot of people would, would think this isn't, I mean, this is not the modern Christianity example that people want to look at as being a Christian, you know, um, this washing of one another's feet. And, and again, Jesus is really, he's about to take the sin, their sin, our sin, everyone's sin upon him and be beaten and whipped and, humiliated and spit on and robbed and all these worst things in this short amount of time you know he's about to be really berated um he's about to really be in this lowly lowly place this lowly state and he's doing so willingly so we really see here peter uh, who's kind of like, you're better than that. And Jesus, again, is trying to show this example, just like later when he would say, uh, no, you're not going to die. And and again, you know, finally, Jesus rebukes him, um, which was necessary. You know, a rebuke, I feel like kind of shakes up our senses and brings us back into the spirit. So, Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And of course, again, that's back. It's, it's, it's a foreshadowing of the cross. You know, if I don't give my life, you can't be with me one day. You can't be with me forever. Uh, and, you know, Simon Peter's not stupid. You know, so in verse nine, he's, he's, you know what he seems to me, I perceive him as he's just very, um, a little brash, you know, just a little quick Simon Peter, which personally, I, I understand that, um, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Cause he's, he's, he's devoted to him. And he's saying, uh, Jesus said, if, if he doesn't wash my feet, I can't be with him. So then, you know what, Lord, wash my whole body. Cause I want to be with you is what he's saying. Um, so Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. And he's speaking to um, their hearts. 
you know, I'm reminded now of Psalm 24, who may ascend the hill of the Lord, but those with a clean heart, pure heart and clean hands, which speaks to innocence. You know, that's what his blood does for you. The charges are dropped, you know, so to speak. You are innocent. You are you are now truly the, the righteousness of God. And that's hard for us, you know, and that's, you know, it's, we're learning to walk this fine line and it is a fine line. It's a narrow path between knowing the great depravity of our hearts and the fact that sometimes we sin and the fact that sometimes we still like sin, the fact that sometimes, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're selfish or we're prideful or we're jealous or we're not considering God, or we're not in our body, you know, that all these ways that we fall short, but also walking the fine line, you know, I just see someone in a tightrope with one of those balancing sticks of knowing this is true, but the Lord says this about me. You know, when we, when we talk about our identity, it is, it's never to puff us up because the closer you get to the Lord, the more you're aware of your desperate need for him because of your desperate depravity, you know, not you, all of us, you know, um, so it's it's always walking that fine line and that should humble you i mean that's perfect it's perfectly scriptural because the closer you get to god the more humble you become in the light of his holiness you know so it's it's less well i feel I, you know you know i don't think any of us ever really feel like we are the righteousness of god but nevertheless we must believe it because he says it is so so When he had washed their their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So it just ever the perfect rabbi, he is setting the example. He is setting the example example you know for so many false teachers in this world one of the you know this real act of humility here the way that you know jesus is the ultimate teacher right the ultimate rabbi and he's he's washing their feet and he's telling them well you call me your lord and your teacher and i am well you see me washing your feet right learn a lesson you know follow the example of you call me teacher and Lord, follow my example. That's really what he's saying here. But again, you know, when we're testing spirits out here and there's so many false teachers, I mean, you can really see the spirit of pride all over so many nowadays. You know, how do you wash feet uh, perfectly adorned? Do you see how Jesus took off his garments? You know, how do you feed sheep when you look like, you know, you're about to go to the, <laughs> you know, to the, to the Pharisee's house for dinner, you know, there's a big lack of humility. And what I hear a lot is, well, you can't judge me outwardly. You know, I hear, uh, well, disciples look all different and people justify, you know, piercings and loud makeup and tight clothing, um, not just women. I mean, you know, guys have their own things, you know, because really it's, it's about the spirit again, you know, guys may not wear makeup. A lot of these, um, a lot, not all for anyone, but a lot of males with these, with bigger ministries may not wear makeup, but a lot of them, you can, you know, kind of discern that they know what they're doing, you know, what, they're, what they're giving off, you know what I mean? And some of the faces on some of the thumbnails, you know, and people are, it's just, it's, it's a lot of acting, that I see, you know, and it's, that's instantly a lack of humility. You know what I mean? Because it, this, as soon as you start to sell to the people, as soon as you start to try to look good for the people, you're wrong. You've already skewed everything. You know, you would never find Jesus in a mirror. You know what I mean? You would never find Jesus, um, putting on this act, you know? Um, so, 
he's telling them to do it for one another, you know, because before this, they were really arguing about who's the best, you know what I mean? Well, who's the best disciple? And my gosh, even though, again, people may not outwardly say that today, by the way that so many adorn themselves and try to spruce up the word, you know, um, have all their human understanding in the words. And it, it's just so much that's going on that's the opposite of washing one another's feet. You know, there's so much cleaning in the house of the Lord to be done. There is, you know, and as someone who sees these dirty corners so often, you know, I'm not someone that likes to present a problem without a solution. Um, I like, I'm a solutions person. I believe, you know, I truly believe all things are fixable. All things are doable. You know, especially we're in the Lord, like, you know, all this can be worked on. Um, but it's a matter of repentance. It is, you know, any prophet is called the people to repent and it's in that repentance that we are restored, that we are taught, that we have understanding, that we are even blessed. You know, so many walk in this outright haughtiness and declaring to the people that their blessings are coming and the people get really haughty. Yeah, my blessings are coming. And it's like, this is a Pharisee mindset because you, you have now hidden the true mystery of God that says Jesus is the door. So humbly walk through Jesus and there be that abundance, you know, there be the abundance through Christ. But that's why the door is narrow, saints. That's why the gate is small and the door is narrow and the path, you know, it's, it's, there's, it's, let's get that. So that's actually Matthew 7, 13, 14. Oh, I, th I think, um, hold on, let's get the new KJV. It's ever important that I am in this new KJV. Um, enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. You know, I had posted something recently that was like, walk like you're blessed, talk like you're blessed, live like you're blessed. And I perceived that many were, um, not all, you know, but many maybe were uncomfortable or felt some type of way about that. But you see, the thing is, consider those who say, wait on your blessings. Your blessings are coming. Don't worry. And people are out there declaring and naming and, and claiming blessings versus walk like you're blessed now. Like, as I say that, can you discern the difference of the message? You know, it may seem outwardly haughty to say, I know I'm blessed, I'm going to walk like it. But that is someone who has understanding that in Christ, they are already blessed. Whatever that means, however that manifests, they are already blessed. As opposed to someone who sits in lack. I know I'm going to be blessed one day. I know God's going to bring me my blessings. You know, this is a very distinct there's a difference here, and the difference is faith. The difference is understanding which comes by faith. It is more humble to walk like you're blessed and to know that you are blessed because you know you're in Christ than it is to sit there in this false faith that says, I'm in lack now, but when I get, when I see it in my hands, then I will know that God is good, right? because blessed are those who believe without seeing. So speaking of blessings, let's continue um, in verse 15. Okay, he actually says, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, and you know, whenever he says that, pay attention. I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And Jesus, you know, he didn't just theoretically, well, I mean, he didn't just wash the feet of the disciples. Do you remember in Luke 
where he actually embraces a leper. You know, he, he cleaned the leper in that embrace. That was one of his miracles. And the leper probably hadn't felt, um, I should say the person with leprosy, probably hadn't felt human contact in probably so long, truly. You know, um, to walk around in ridicule, you're not allowed to be near the masses. So you have no, not just physical contact, but no emotional contact, no friends, probably no family. Um, you know, even their, their cleaning rituals would have had to be everything. I mean, um, you know, worse than slaves, absolutely, were the lepers treated. And Jesus washes this leper's feet again, so to speak, by embracing them and everyone's just like or embracing him rather and everyone is just like you know even the disciples weren't of such faith yet and as we go higher on this walk you know like i said recently going higher in faith is really going lower here on this earth because we're ever remembering that we the servants are not greater than our master you know, people for completely forget the S word, you know, but again, it's a fine line that we walk because you might say, well, Kelly, you said I'm the righteousness of Christ. You said that we're increasing in boldness. You know, you said we're going higher. So how can you say that we're servants? But this is the fine line because that's what it takes to do the work of the Lord. It takes the power, love and sound mind of the Holy Spirit to love radically. It takes a holy boldness to contend for the gospel to praise the Lord as you're being persecuted. And many of us will be, you know, I think that's still some sort of story to us, this persecution, but I tell you what, this is coming sooner than we can imagine. And the lukewarm today, those who kind of walk in that hot, that haughtiness today, um, who, ha who, who haven't been okay. Trained by the practice of righteousness is what I would just put on my heart. We haven't been trained, you know, because that's what's happening is we're being trained by the practice of righteousness. These are the, the apostates, you know, because they never truly came to the truth, not fully that when faced with adversity, they'll fall away. And that's actually, uh, right. That's actually, um, in the parable of the sower, that's actually a type of dirt, a type of dirt that a seed was thrown upon. Remember the parable of the sower and, um, well, we're not going to get into that right now, but that's, that's what's happening here is, is you're being trained up in righteousness. And that's what Jesus was doing here and teaching them that, you know, you, you can do all these great miracles with your hands. You know, I showed Paul the third heaven or the fourth heaven, you know, um, I'm giving you all this authority. I'm your personal rabbi, the son of God, like knowing all this, I'm telling you to wash one another's feet. You know, it's, it's, it's like being this great, great king, but going out to this food kitchen, the soup kitchens, you know, I don't know what other example to give, you know what I mean? But it, that's the, that's your challenge today as a disciple is to know all the authority and power and all the love and the great wisdom and understanding that has been endowed to you and not to use it to your advantage nor to your understanding, but to use it exactly by the example of the scriptures. You know, Holy Spirit has been saying that as well, you know, because there's a lot of flawed human understanding out here of the scriptures. So when we wrestle he had me I recently was in a discussion with someone and we were disagreeing about an understanding of scripture. Um, and it was about whether, you know, a lot of men still say women shouldn't teach and it, it's not easy, you know, ladies, you know, especially ladies called to ministry, you know, the Lord has given some of us many abilities and a lot of authority and great boldness. And that's difficult for a woman because especially a lot of religious men take offense to it. A lot of, uh, frankly, haughty women just don't like it. And it can be a very lonely place as a woman. And so they're often the, the discussion comes up that, well, you shouldn't even be teaching. You shouldn't even be preaching. And what was put on my heart by Holy Spirit is 
because you could sit there all day arguing that my understanding versus your understanding. So Holy Spirit was like, we'll look to the example of scripture. What is actually done? Do women, are there women in the scriptures who actually teach? Yes, there are. Then that's not what Paul meant. Immediately the, the understanding, the human understanding that Paul was actually saying that no women should ever teach a man is immediately wrong because the actual example of scripture is that women did teach, right? And Jesus, you better bet that God some somewhere in the Bible would have been like, and then that woman was rebuked because she shouldn't have taught the man. No, that doesn't happen because women can teach and did teach in, in the OT and the NT. You know, this is just an example. They did. And so that's a good way for us to, you know, be of one mind and one accord instead of being divided. Well, they shouldn't teach. And I'm like, yeah, we can teach because I have an ability to teach. And it's like, it, it's stupid. Just look at this, the example. What did they actually do in the Bible? Well, then, you know, so all of this is, it's just, it's coming down. I believe there's many walls being broken down is what was just put on my heart to allow us to wash one another's feet. You know, because at the end of, of such a discussion, at, at the end of all these discussions where um, we both love God and we both want to do well by him, at the end of the discussion, we, we need to be able to be of one mind and one accord. We need to know one gospel. We need to have one understanding so that we can have one voice right? Because we're what we have here on this earth. Yes, we have Holy Spirit, but you are meant to be part of this body of Christ. It is for God's will and for his usage that we work together. So the Lord is saying, follow my example. And if you do, then you're blessed. And if you're blessed, you walk like you're blessed, right? Verse 18, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. And, you know, for those who should say that Jesus is not Messiah, you know, all these scriptures were, were fulfilled naturally. You know, Jesus didn't, I mean, it's just impossible by the very scriptures, you know, there's so many, especially Jew, I mean, not just Jewish people, but uh, the Lord always has the Jewish people on my heart. Um, but there's so many who don't believe that he's God, even after they, they read the scriptures, because they have no understanding. But it's so, it's so obvious, you know, because these scriptures were coming to pass. Do they think that it was a coincidence that he picked, jo the, that he picked Judas? You know, and that Judas betrayed him just like it was prophesied. No, he knew the hearts of men. Well, how did he know the hearts of men? Oh, well, that he cheated. He knew Judas was going to betray him. So he's not the son of man. He knew Judas would betray him because he knew the hearts of men. How did he know the hearts of men? Because he was God. You know what I mean? Like it's, there's just so, there's layers upon layers upon layers of proof that Jesus is and was God, you know? So, he who eats bread with me has lifted his heel against me. And he's prophesying, he's quoting the Old Testament. Now I tell you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. And this is such a word for us today. You know, this is reminding me of when he says, to, when he commissions the disciples and sends them out. And he says, if you go to someone's home, what he says is, I've been meaning to share this. He, what he says is, uh, rest your peace upon that house. And if they receive you, then they're going to have that peace. But if they don't receive you, that house, then call your peace back to you and leave. And he, he makes peace sound tangible. And it is. And that's something he wants us to learn too. Just like faith. Faith is not just a word. Faith is the substance, right? It's a substance of things unseen. And that's just like peace. 
peace, the way he describes it in that scripture, he actually says, rest your peace upon the house. But if they were, if they were, if they don't receive you, take that peace back. You know what I mean? It's almost like you're like casting this net of, of peace on, on someone, you know? So know that, know that, like start to understand the great power of the Holy Spirit within you, you know? There's a reason atmospheres shift when you come. There's a reason why there's, uh, formerly you go somewhere and there's a lot of division and then people start to get along and, and you know, the, everything changes and it's the presence of the Holy Spirit because you might just be sitting, you know, you go to a restaurant, you're just sitting there eating, but that Holy Spirit, he's all over that place. He's all, everyone's affected. Like I've been seeing that in my, in a vision lately, like, I can't explain it. It's like when you go somewhere, you know how you fl you fl uh, you put on a flashlight. I'm sorry, I might be a little tired, but I, I wanted to share this. You put on a flashlight, and imagine you're holding the flashlight and at your chest, and you flash it out, and it covers a big span. That's like what you cover, like your territory as a Holy Spirit filled believer is not just your footsteps. It's literally like there's a span, like he goes before you and beside you and all around you. You know what I mean? Like, I just can't, we'll get more into that soon. But that's what he says here. And he's like, whoever receives you receives me. And if they receive me, they receive God. So do you see that as a part of bring your, your job to bring God's will to pass here on earth? Like that's really big. You know, how can people receive God if they don't receive Jesus, if they don't receive you? You know, if you just hold yourself up, you know, and isolate yourself and be introverted, as so many Christians say, which, you know, I don't, I don't believe in. I know that some, I know many are, but I believe if they would keep going, that the boldness would replace that. You know what I mean? It's sometimes we say, oh, this is what I am. No, keep going. That's, you're not, you're not cooked yet. No, there's another level. There's deeper. There's more than that. There's more, there's more, there's more. Keep going. You know, when you keep going, then it, it's like when you're hiking a mountain, you can't stop on the side of the mountain. You stop at the plateau. You know what I mean? And and then you could take a little break ski. But you, so many, they stop. They stop in the midst of the climbing. They stop in the midst of the climbing. You have to keep ascending the hill of the Lord and you don't stop until he says so. So when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. You know, it's that knowing, you know. Many of you have had that knowing that someone's, you ever talk to someone and you just know they're lying to you? Oh, you just know they're lying to you or they're gaslighting you or they're just, you know, it could maybe someone you don't even know personally, you go somewhere and they're just, they're just nasty to you. It's troubling in spirit. It's very troubling in spirit. So this is to the utmost. Then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. And it goes to show the hearts of the disciples, because even though Judas was a thief in stealing from the money bag, he was the treasurer. He was their treasurer. And he was stealing from them all. They never thought that. You know, today, modern Christianity, we can be so paranoid of one another. A person has an off day or somebody gets a bad feeling and it's like, oh no, they're the devil. You know, it happens in churches, especially all the time. People go through hard times. Oh, God's punishing them. And it's, it's like here, we don't see that with the disciples, you know, for all of their, um, you know, sometimes they can be a little, I don't want to say foolish because that's a big insult, but they can be like a little without understanding, like we can all, all be, but for all that, they were very trusting which is something else that we need in the body of Christ. We need to have, uh, if you really trust the Lord, you will trust others more freely because there's no fear in love. I mean, that's another thing he's talking about. You know, love has to be pure a hundred percent. And if even 1% of fear is in it, it's imperfect. And that's why there's so many Christians nowadays teaching pointing the finger at narcissists, teaching hundreds of boundaries, all these types of boundaries, when the only people that we shouldn't associate with are the ones Jesus told us not to. False teachers, false believers, 
you know, um, whatever he said, that's what we should be doing. If we continue to draw the line at our personal feelings and boundaries, we are ineffective for God's work. And we make liars and hypocrites of ourselves because our love is infested with fear. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? So Oh, sorry. Verse 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. That's John. Hi, Kiki's. Hi. Come on, it's Bible study. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. You know, I, I have, I think, I believe that this is what will happen with the Antichrist. Because, you know, three and a half years in, there's going to be a great shift in his politics and in his agenda, the Antichrist. And I believe that that's when Satan will enter him, just like this. And I don't, I you know, I actually thought that was in the Bible. But a couple of years ago, I realized it wasn't. So I think that's just a gift of knowledge. But I believe that that's exactly why there will be such this great shift leading to the abomination of the desolation. And because at first, you know, there'll be this great peace, 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 peace. And then boom, I demanding to be worshiped as God. Boom. I'm going to kill all the Christians. You know, Satan will answer him, excuse me, will enter him. And remember, we see this gradually happening here. Judas is a liar first. He's a thief. He's greedy, right? And then at the dinner table, Satan is right there. Amongst all the disciples, he's right there and he puts it in Judas's heart, the door wide open, the door is wide open to his heart and he puts, he puts in his heart what he's about to do. And then Jesus, and then Jesus exposes him, right? As soon as Jesus exposes him and he gives them the bread, right? Do not be overcome by darkness, but overcome darkness by, um, by light, by love. I'm so sorry. I had to look that up again. So do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And, you know, that's really telling us that Jesus had to expose him right there. You know, um, nothing he ever did was arbitrary. He, Judas needed to be exposed to fulfill the scriptures, you know, um, and not even necessarily of an Old Testament prophesying, but even of that scripture right there, like Jesus was shedding light on darkness and as soon as he exposes Judas, Satan actually enters him. So let's keep going. Having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him for some thought because Judas had the money box that Jesus had said to him, buy those things we need for the feast or that he should give something to the poor. So they truly had zero idea. They had no idea. You know, and, and a lot of you have been there too, where it's like, is this person close to me seriously a liar? Seriously a thief, a betrayer? Like you can't believe it. Having received the piece of bread, then he went out immediately and it was night. So as soon as, as he's exposed, as soon as Jesus exposes that darkness, uh, the darkness flees. And that's, that's the scriptures too. So when he had gone out, Jesus said, now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. 
you will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So I felt led to go to the Strongs to look up anew because the the command that uh, Jesus gives here to them that they should love one another as others have loved them, it's not new as we would understand it. I mean, the entire Ten Commandments, right? Jesus is the completion of the law. You know, we're constantly going back between the OT and the NT because it testifies of itself. This is why when people negate the law or act like the law is garbage, you know, that's then you don't understand who Jesus is. It's a lack of understanding because the whole entirety of the Ten Commandments are showing them how to love one another, right? Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Don't murder each other. You know, it's it's about how to treat one another and how to treat God. That's the first and second greatest commandments. That is the Ten Commandments. And that's what he's telling them here. And so that word new, when you go into the Strongs and you take into account the context, you can understand that word new to be more like now. And in the Strongs, it says something like about freshness. You know, it's a now word, which makes perfect sense because you know, he's here teaching them to wash one another's feet. And he wraps up his lesson by saying, love one another as I have loved you. And this is how, you know, not only is that biblical, you know, love one another as I have loved you. That's the second greatest commandment um, to love one another as you want to be loved or, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. But also by doing this, them and you today by loving people how you would want to be loved all all people you know i mean specifically this is speaking to the brethren but again we see when jesus was loving the leper he was cleaning the leper by embracing him that it's certainly not limited to only believers um even his acts of deliverance of healing were all love you know uh, so this, these are evidences that you are his disciples. That was an evidence that he was from God, right? Many miracles he did and people were like, wow, you really are the son of man. You know, because miracles serve a purpose. The more willing you are to love fearlessly, not contaminated with your human understanding, you know, the more obvious it is that you are his disciples. It says right there, by this, all will know that you were my disciples. So we're wrapping up here on um, verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. That hit me. As usual, Simon Peter is talking about right now. He's in the moment. And as usual, Jesus is in, he's way up high. You know, he's way up high. Wow. And that's actually going back to what he just said. This He says, now the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. Wow. You know, he's really speaking already in the future here, you know, because he wouldn't be fully glorified until, you know, until he was crucified, until he was resurrected and then he would ascend, you know, but it is finished. Like he was already saying here at the dinner table, it is finished. Like that's just unreal. And so he's in this bigger picture here, you know, um, Simon Peter, where are you going? You going outside? You going to get food? You know, when Jesus is in just another place, he's already, he's already glorified. He's already just in that high place. And he's like, where I'm going, you cannot follow me. And he's talking about the cross is what I'm saying. He's talking about the cross, uh, but you shall follow me afterward. Right. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you? I will lay down my life for your sake. Jesus answered him, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. So in closing, you know, when, um, 
when Peter does go and, and deny Jesus, you know, it's such a representation. It's so it's so important. It's not just about one man denying Jesus. It's really an illustration of all of our failure and then his inevitable grace. Because Peter would deny Jesus three times. And then Jesus would still go on to receive him back. Remember, do you love me, Peter? Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me, Peter? Right? That's that's soon to come after he denies him. He kind of reinstates him. We had a video on this um, a while back. And he says, feed my sheep. That's what he says. He says, do you love me? All right, then feed my sheep. And that's what we're doing here today. Um, feeding his sheep washing one another's feet, remaining in humility at the feet of the Lord, and continuing to continue to, saints, rest that peace that the Lord has endowed you with. You have it. You know, live in it, walk in it. You know, that's all about knowing that you're blessed. You have these tools in your tool belt already. You have to exercise them. You've got to use them. You've got to let that faith be stretched. Oh, but I look around and I, you know, my life is a mess. Yeah, but guess what? You still have peace. You're still blessed. You have the Holy Spirit. You know, this is faith. It is sometimes even radically forsaking what you see in favor of what God has said. So let's wrap up there. I love you guys so much. I apologize if this was a little everywhere. Um, I was going to, I was going to scrap it a couple times. I know it's really long, but, um, cause I like to be a little more concise, but, um, I feel like we hit some good points here. So, I love you.